Hello, I'm Chris Morosky, and this video is titled Primary Amenorrhea. It is part of our Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology Conference Series. This conference is produced by and presented normally with Dr. Elizabeth Deckers from Hartford Hospital. The goals and objectives of this video are as follows. Define primary and secondary amenorrhea. Review the HPO access in relation to the menstrual cycle. Describe the workup of a patient presenting with primary amenorrhea. Discuss treatment options for patients with mullerianogenesis and solve an interprofessional education obstacle. Let's first learn about our patient, TM. TM is a 15-year-old female who presents for her annual pediatric physical exam. When you inquire about the date of her last menstrual period, she states that she has not yet had a period. She thought that this was normal because she is a cross-country runner and most of her teammates rarely get periods. What is in your differential diagnosis and what physical exam would you perform? Before discussing the differential diagnosis and physical exam, let's first review some of the definitions of primary and secondary amenorrhea. The definition of primary amenorrhea includes both the presence or absence of secondary sexual characteristics as well as the age of the patient. For example, with a patient who has normal development of secondary sexual characteristics, such as breast development, pubic and axillary hair development, acne and other signs of adrenarche and a growth spurt, the age cutoff for absence of menses is 15 years old before diagnosing primary amenorrhea. However, for patients with no development of secondary sexual characteristics, the absence of menses by age 13 should warrant the definition of primary amenorrhea and initiate a workup. Patients with secondary amenorrhea normally have had periods previously and now have ceased their menstruation. Similarly, there are two parts to the definition of secondary amenorrhea. Secondary amenorrhea is defined as no menses for six months. However, for patients with very regular menstrual cycles, no menses for three missed cycles would be used as the criteria for the definition of secondary amenorrhea. So for example, for a patient who has her period January, February, March, April, and all of a sudden she has no periods, you wouldn't wait all the way until October before diagnosing her with secondary amenorrhea. You would wait for three months later, May, June, July, and if no periods at that point, she would be diagnosed as having secondary amenorrhea. For patients with irregular periods, such as polycystic ovarian syndrome patients, the absence of menses for six months would be the definition for secondary amenorrhea. All right, and to also help with our differential diagnosis, physical exam, and some of the lab testing that we're going to want to do coming up soon, let's just briefly go over how a woman gets her period. It turns out the menstrual period begins in the brain. Yep, that's right, in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus normally secretes GnRH in a pulsatile fashion. It is very important to maintain this pulsatility so that there can be proper stimulation of the anterior pituitary. The gonadotropes in the anterior pituitary both produce and secrete follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH, and luteinizing hormone, or LH. These two gonadotropins travel through the bloodstream to the ovaries. They cause oocyte development, ovulation, and eventually production of a corpus luteum. The growing oocyte in the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle secretes large amounts of estrogen. The corpus luteum that forms following ovulation from the remaining granulosa cells secretes large amounts of progesterone in the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. Both estrogen and progesterone have an effect on the endometrium of the uterus. During the proliferative phase, estrogen stimulates the proliferation and growth of the endometrium. During the secretory phase, progesterone creates a stable endometrium that has secretion of fluid which is both helpful to an early pregnancy. In the absence of pregnancy, the estrogen and progesterone both fall, the endometrium breaks down, and begins to pass as the menstrual period. As you can see, a patent outflow tract through the cervix and the vagina is required to have menstrual bleeding. 
This is perhaps a bit of an oversimplification of where the menstrual period comes from, but you can see that with abnormalities all the way from the level of the hypothalamus to the pituitary, ovaries, uterus, and outflow tract can all be responsible for causes of primary and secondary amenorrhea. All right, so with primary and secondary amenorrhea defined, and a brief overview of where the menstrual period comes from, let's review our differential diagnosis and physical exam. Here are the next steps in the workup of our patient, TM. The differential diagnosis of primary amenorrhea as seen in our patient, TM, would include the following. Pregnancy, physiologic delay of puberty, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, Turner syndrome or gonadal dysgenesis, Mullerian agenesis, androgen insensitivity syndrome, Kalman syndrome or hypopituitarism, transverse vaginal septum, and polycystic ovarian syndrome. The following is a physical exam that was performed on our patient, TM. Vital signs. She is 5 feet 6 inches tall and 120 pounds. Her blood pressure is 100 over 60, her pulse 50, respiratory rate 18, and her temperature 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. On general appearance, she is a well-developed adolescent female in no acute distress. Her HENT exam includes no scleral icterus, no thyromegaly, and normal hearing bilaterally. On cardiovascular exam, she has a regular rate and rhythm with no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. On chest exam, her lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally with no wheezes. Her breast exam is Tanner stage 4. On abdominal exam, her abdomen is soft, non-tender, and non-distended. On pelvic exam, she has Tanner stage 4 pubic hair, a normal clitoris, normal labia minora and majora, a normal urethra. However, her vagina is shortened and it is unable to accommodate a pediatric speculum. She has a normal appearing anus. What additional lab tests would you perform? Based on our differential diagnosis and her physical exam findings, what radiologic and laboratory testing values might you want to consider ordering in the workup of our patient TM's primary amenorrhea? The following is the results of the additional radiologic and lab tests that should have been performed on our patient TM. On abdominal and pelvic ultrasound, she is found to have absence of the left kidney. However, she has a normal appearing right kidney with no hydronephrosis. There is no evidence of a uterus. She has bilateral ovaries high in the pelvis, which are normal in size and appearance. Her labs show the following. Her urine pregnancy test is negative. Her serum testosterone level is within the normal female range. Her karyotype is 46XX. Her serum FSH and LH are within the normal female postmenarche range. Her serum TSH and prolactin are both normal. Combining this all together, our patient TM, who's presenting with primary amenorrhea, has an absent vagina on physical exam, an absent uterus on ultrasound, normal female levels of testosterone, and a karyotype, which is 46XX. This gives her the diagnosis of Mullerian agenesis. The following is important to keep in mind when discussing the treatment options for Mullerian agenesis patients. Importantly, these adolescent patients are often not thinking about pregnancy at the time of their diagnosis. Their parents might be. Often in the first visit where the physician is revealing the diagnosis of Mullerian agenesis, both the patient and her parents will be present. It is important to direct the conversation to the patient related to her concerns and questions and to the parents related to their concerns and questions. Sometimes it's important to have follow-up visits separately with the patient or with the parents to discuss their concerns and questions separately. At the time of diagnosis for the adolescent patients, there may be more questions related to the development of their vagina as well as their ability to have intercourse. Also, there are lots of questions about being normal from both the patient and often her parents. It is important to let the patient and her parents know that the abnormality lies in the absence of the uterus, cervix, and portions of the vagina. Importantly, these patients are at risk for having renal, urologic, and skeletal abnormalities as well. However, the rest of their physical development is usually completely normal. Also, it is very important to consider a referral to a pediatric adolescent gynecologic specialist. Mullerian agenesis is a fairly rare condition affecting only 1 out of 5,000 women. P. 
pediatric adolescent gynecologists specialize in this condition and see many of these patients every single year. Pediatric adolescent gynecologists also can counsel on the full breadth of treatment options, which is very complex. Finally, through their training, pediatric adolescent gynecologists are the specialists who perform the surgical procedures, including complicated vaginoplasty. In these next two slides, we will briefly review some of the treatment that is available for creating a normal vagina for patients diagnosed with melanogenesis. The first treatment option is vaginal dilator therapy. Patients are first assessed for vaginal dilator therapy by asking them about when they're ready to perform creation of a new vagina. For some patients, this is close to their diagnosis, and for other patients, this is years later. Creation of a vagina and the timing of such is up to the individual patient. Vaginal dilator therapy is effective in greater than 90% of patients and should be offered primarily. Patients are instructed to use increasing sizes of vaginal dilators for approximately 20 minutes every day, twice a day. In particular, for patients with a very small dimple of a vagina, it is important for patients to differentiate between the urethral opening and the small vaginal opening. Firm, steady pressure is applied for 20 minutes. Patients should feel steady pressure, but not pain. If there is pain, they may be pushing too hard. If there is no pressure, they may not be pushing hard enough. Patients should be instructed to avoid in and out motions. It is important to perform vaginal dilator therapy twice daily every day, and so finding a routine is really important for these patients. Patients are seen in the office regularly to decide when is the time to increase the size of their vaginal dilator. For patients who perform vaginal dilator therapy twice a day every day, they can expect creation of a normal functional vagina for intercourse after approximately three to six months. For some patients, however, this can take up to a year and a half until it is effective. Patients are instructed that they need to continue vaginal dilator therapy daily or to begin intravaginal intercourse to maintain the length of their vagina. In the absence of continued treatment, vaginal attenuation and shrinking can occur over time. For patients who fail vaginal dilator therapy or for patients where vaginal dilators are not their treatment of choice, surgical treatment options are available. There are various surgical treatment options, but in this slide, we review the Davidoff procedure for the creation of a neovagina. As you can see in the top left panel, the procedure begins with an incision into the vaginal opening. Again, this is usually a very small dimple. In this portion of the slide, as well as the top middle portion of the slide, it can be seen that the next step of the surgical procedure is to dissect through the firm fibrous tissue between the vaginal opening all the way up to the parietal peritoneum. This procedure is often performed by a trained specialist because the bladder and the bowel are in close proximity and there is possibility for organ injury. Furthermore, these patients have the most successful outcomes with the first surgery and it needs to be performed properly the very first time. As can be seen in the right middle part of the diagram, an incision is made in the peritoneum. In the bottom middle portion of the diagram, you can see that the peritoneum has been pulled down and sewn to the external part of the vagina and vulva. Using laparoscopy, a purse string suture is performed to close off the opening to the peritoneum so there is no prolapse of the intraperitoneal organs. A neovagina has been created. These patients will often stay overnight in the hospital and be discharged the next day. Their full recovery will take several weeks and sometimes vaginal dilator therapy does need to be performed in the initial recovery period to maintain a patent vagina. Okay, with everything that you've learned about our patient TM and the diagnosis, treatment, and management of mullerinogenesis, here we have for you an interprofessional education obstacle. There is no in-network pediatric adolescent gynecologist, and your patient and her mother are concerned about the cost of an out-of-network referral. What do you do? Well, the right thing to consider here is physician advocacy. You educate the insurance company's medical director about the diagnosis of mullerian agenesis and improved patient outcomes with appropriate specialist referral. The insurance company agrees to cover referral to an out-of-network specialist. Knowing about the presence of an insurance company's medical director is very important. Often, physician-to-physician, peer-to-peer conversations can help the insurance company realize the importance of patients to receive care that is critical to their condition.
You also discuss patient advocacy groups and the importance of peer support and psychological counseling for the patient and her family members. Your patient and her mother attend a local conference for women diagnosed with MRKH and join private Facebook groups for additional support. In these next final slides, we'll show you some references of support groups and information for yourself, your patients, and their families regarding mullerian agenesis. The first is the ACOG Committee Opinion on Mullerian Agenesis, titled Mullerian Agenesis Diagnosis, Management, and Treatment. This is mostly a fairly clinical document and is probably most helpful to clinicians providing treatment. However, it is a very thorough view and often very helpful. In this next slide, we show the website Center for Young Women's Health. This can be found at youngwomenshealth.org. A quick search for MRKH, which stands for Meyer Rokitansky Kuster Hauser Syndrome, which is another term for mullerianogenesis, will provide lots of resources for patients and their families. In a quick review of the website, there are topics such as Can MRKH Affect Breast Development? Talking to your partner about MRKH. I have MRKH syndrome and have unprotected sex. I don't have to worry about getting pregnant, right? On top of this, there are several guides for parents, patients, and clinicians related to MRKH or Mullerian agenesis. The next website that we highlight here is Beautiful You MRKH. This is an online support group for the Beautiful You MRKH Foundation. This is a great website for patients and their families. It provides support to teens, women, and families. They are advocates for MRKH. It is a place to go for medically accurate information about MRKH for patients and their families. Um, and importantly, this foundation partners with physicians and funds research into the causes and treatments of MRKH or mullerian agenesis. All right, everybody. Well, that's about going to do it for this video on primary amenorrhea and mullerian agenesis. Let's review again our goals and objectives. Define primary and secondary amenorrhea. Review the HPO access in relation to the menstrual cycle. Describe the workup of a patient presenting with primary amenorrhea. Discuss treatment options for patients with mullerian agenesis. And solve an interprofessional education obstacle. Great job. Thanks for watching our video. Good luck with your studies, and we'll see you around, everybody. Bye-bye.